And thank you everybody for joining us tonight. Um, we have Dr. Saba Abudiat here, and he is one of our physical medicine and rehabilitation physicians here at Rothman Institute. He is going to speak tonight on neck and back pain. Sorry, I lost my screen here. Here we are. Um, so if you have any questions during the course of the lecture, you can go ahead and put those in the Q&A. And uh, after Dr. Abudia is done speaking, we'll review some of the questions for maybe 10 or 15 minutes. Um, if you have a very personalized question regarding your own medical care, um, I would urge you to speak with your physician, or you can send me a, a message directly. We can get you scheduled with an appointment with Dr. Abudia. But other than that, I know you guys came to hear him speak, not me. So go ahead. Hi, everyone. Thanks. Thanks for everyone for logging in today. Um, I'm Saba Boudiat. I'm one of the interventional spine and uh, physical medicine and rehab doctors here at Rothman um, Orthopedics. Um, the purpose of my lecture today is it's kind of going to be about kind of the non-operative diagnosis and treatment of neck and low back pain, which pretty much everyone has or is going to have at some point in time. So um, I'll just get right to it with my lecture. I'll share my screen here. This. All right. So kind of just an overview. I'm very briefly going to go over kind of just exam findings. I'm not going to go over the full-fledged physical exam for neck and low back, but just a few points just to, so when you see a doctor or you're seeing a spine specialist, I, I think it always helps if you kind of know why we're doing the things we're doing in the office visit. Um, and how it kind of helps focus on where we think the problem is coming from. Um, I'm also going to go over some different types of pain patterns. So depending on where the pain is and, and why we always ask if it's in the back, if it's in the leg, in the arm or in the neck, it kind of actually gives us a lot of information about where in the neck or where in the low back the problem is coming from. Um, we're also going to talk about different types of spine pain. So it, it can be either axial spine pain or what we call radicular spine pain. Um, and really the treatment for it is very, very different. So this kind of will help kind of explain that part of it. Um, and then I'll kind of just very briefly touch base on some of the injections that we do, um, both me and, and all the other interventional spine and physical medicine and rehab docs uh, in Rothman. So looking over here, um, when we're looking at the cervical spine, depending on what muscles or what movements are affected, um, and this is for the upper extremity. So this is kind of the neck and the arms. Depending on what weakness, what sensation changes we see and what reflex changes we see kind of can tell us exactly which nerve roots are most likely the problem. And this is even before any x-rays or MRIs or anything like that is done. We can get a pretty good idea based on these exam findings. We have different tests that we do as well. So like I said, I won't go through every single test and what it is, but for example, if we have do what's called a spurlings and it reproduces pain that radiates down your arm, it tells us, hey, you know what, there might be a radiculopathy here. There either is a disc herniation or a pinched nerve in your neck. Another test is known as the Hoffman's. This kind of tells us, hey, there's something else going on that's more central, meaning it's a spinal cord or a brain issue. Um, and it's a very easy test where I just basically we flick your middle finger on the nail of it. And if your thumb and finger and your index finger twitch and touch each other, that's a positive test. It kind of tells us, hey, this is a little more serious than just a pinched nerve in your neck. Um, same thing for the low back, right? So different muscles, different actions in the low back just on exam will tell us, hey, exactly which nerve root in the low back is likely causing the problem. Um, and same thing again, different types of tests that we do in the office will tell us, hey, what is the issue? What is the probable issue? And kind of what's the red flag that we need to look out for of, hey, this is more than just a disc herniation or a pinched nerve in your back. So all that taken into account, we kind of enter in pain patterns. So I kind of start, and I usually in all my office visits, I, I always have this picture and the next picture pulled up because I think visualizing where you're having the pain mm -hmm and kind of being able to say, hey, like, yes, purple is me or yellow is me kind of helps illustrate, hey, what is the problem that I'm feeling? Um, and that way, when you see the x-ray, it all kind of, you can visualize a little bit better about what the problem is. So every level in the neck is correlating with the pain pattern somewhere down the arm. So that's why we always ask, where's it radiating down the arm? Which fingers are affected? Sometimes it sounds funny, like, why are they asking me about my fingers when my neck hurts? But when you think about it and you start having either numbness, tingling, pain in specific areas of the arm, it really does tell me where in the neck this problem is coming from. 
sometimes I see it all the time. People have either a pinched nerve or like a large disc herniation in the neck and they have no neck pain and all they feel is arm or shoulder pain. Um, and that alone will tell me, hey, where is this herniation and how do we need to go about treating it? Same thing for the low back. So every level of the low back kind of correlates with the pain pattern down the leg. A lot of times people say, I feel like the side of my leg hurts. They mentioned the IT band hurts. Sometimes this is usually the L5 nerve that's causing the problem. Um, sometimes they say the front of my leg hurts. My thigh hurts. Could be an L3 or an L4 issue. Sometimes people say, I have pain in my hamstring all the way down the back of my leg into my calf. This is more of an S1 issue. So this alone also, just like the neck and the arm, can tell us, hey, where is the pain coming from? I also, this is something that is just from my training, we used to call it a pain in the schneck, where we get a lot of times where you kind of say, hey, my shoulder really hurts. You see a shoulder specialist or an orthopedic surgeon, and they look at your shoulder and they say, this is not your shoulder, this is the neck. And then I usually get someone who's a little confused on why their shoulder hurts and why they're being sent to a neck specialist. So the joints of the spine, which I'll kind of touch on a little bit briefly too, will cause these different pain patterns down. And they usually just localize right in the neck too. So based on where you're pointing of where the pain is, I can kind of pinpoint what joints are the issue or multiple joints are the issue, again, without even having to do an x-ray or an MRI. Um, and this is again, where these pain patterns come into play. Another big one we get is, is it my hip or is it the low back? A lot of people point kind of to the outside of their hip or into the buttock region and say, my hip hurts. You see a hip specialist, the hip specialist gets an x-ray and says, there's nothing wrong with your hip. And then again, they come see one of the spine specialists and are a little confused on why they think it's their back. Usually if it is your hip, that is the issue. It is going to be groin pain. Like you kind of see here in the picture on the, um, I guess, on the right or on the left, depending on how you see my screen. Um, if it's more on the back or in the side, it's going to be more of a back issue. It's very rarely hip pain if it is not in the groin. Um, and then the last one, which is kind of a, a spine specialist word, is a lot of people say, I have sciatica. And it's pretty much everyone calls leg pain, pain down the leg sciatica. And there's really absolutely nothing wrong with calling it that. But there is a difference between true sciatica and a pinched nerve in your back. Usually the sciat, what happens is it's usually one of these guys, L4, L5, S1, that's causing the issue down the leg. And it's just the blanket statement is called sciatica. But the sciatic nerve actually doesn't even form until kind of right into the buttock region. And it goes through a muscle called the piriformis. Some of us might have heard the word piriformis syndrome. So what happens is that muscle actually pushes on the sciatic nerve and can mimic a lumbar radiculopathy or mimic pain coming from the low back. The reason why I bring this up is because I have had people that do their own research and they start doing exercises for sciatic or sciatic nerve and they're like, it's not getting me any better. The issue is if you do more of exercises for the piriformis muscle, muscle and your issue is in the spine itself, it's not going to get better because the issue is not actually the sciatic nerve. It's, it's one of these nerve roots in the back. So this is also something I always like to just tell everyone, especially in lectures that I give, just to kind of show the difference between true sciatica and actual what we call lumbosacral radiculopathy or a pinched nerve in your back. So all that being said, come into types of spine pain. So that kind of goes into two separate kind of areas. It's either what we call axial. So this is pain pretty much right in your back and radicular, which is pain down the legs. And there's different things that can cause this type of pain. So Axial pain is usually like a muscle strain. It's due to the joints of the spine that we call the facets. It can be just due to the disc, which is different than a disc herniation. It's more just the disc itself that's painful. Um, and radicular pain is usually due to a disc herniation, which is a disc pushing into the nerve and kind of coming out of that disc that itself. And neuroforaminal stenosis, which essentially is this neuroforamen is a tunnel where the nerves are leaving your spine and you get pinching of that nerve when it's coming out of that tunnel. These things can cause pain down the leg. The other ones that I have stars next to, these are kind of, they become this kind of gray area that make things a little complicated. Central stenosis, which is also a lot of people hear it as spinal stenosis, is pinching of the nerve within the middle of your spinal canal itself. So that's kind of pushing everything in the middle. This can sometimes just be back pain. A lot of times this is dealing with leg pain in both 
on both sides. It's kind of nonspecific, meaning it's kind of all over the place. The whole leg feels fatigued. A lot of times people notice pain when walking um, and that pain in the leg or the fatigue in the leg gets worse. People tend to like to lean on a shopping cart. The medical term is positive shopping cart sign. It's ruined grocery shopping for me because I can kind of start diagnosing people just based on how they're leaning on a shopping cart. But that's usually a sign of spinal stenosis. And then, of course, the things you don't want to see is metastasis or cancer. Cancer usually causes bone pain without any radiating pain down the legs. Um, so that's something that we also want to keep an eye on. But this is super rare. Um, and then last is facet cysts, which is you can develop cysts due to arthritis in these joints that will then in turn the cyst pushes on the nerve. So the issue is not a disc issue. It's not a bone issue. It's a cyst kind of pushing onto that nerve itself. So why is this important to kind of know and be very particular about what type of back pain you're having? And the reason why is the treatment for it is very, very different. Axial versus radiating pain is very different. Um, my kind of algorithm for treating spine pain is on top of lifestyle changes and non-opiate management, and I kind of will go over some of the medications in a, in a later slide, is then it starts kind of physical therapy. I think really physical therapy and, and good physical therapy truly is the key to help. I would say the vast majority of patients, if not completely improved, significantly improved with the correct type of physical therapy, that they never even get to these last two sections, which is injections in the back or surgery or pain management. Um, but as it happens, sometimes physical therapy can't get rid of all of it. And sometimes physical therapy does make the pain worse. It really doesn't mean anything was done incorrectly. It just means your body is not responding to this treatment. And that's kind of when we enter the interventional spine part, which is what I do. So lifestyle, what do I mean by that? Weight loss, diet, ergonomic changes, smoking cessation, stress management, exercise. Uh, I have with weight loss, as important as it is, I try to understand that when you're in a lot of pain, this is very difficult to do. So I don't hone on this immediately. I think it's important and it should be part of the treatment plan at some point, but you kind of got to need to get rid of your back pain before you can really, really focus on a lot of weight loss. So I do try to be aware of that. And I think a lot of it can come with just diet and just ergonomic changes very easily can help reduce pain. Um, that will then let us get to the eventual weight loss. Ergonomics, big post-COVID. We always, in, in training, we always had this joke that COVID was pretty good for the back pain um, industry. And, and the main reason why is everyone left office settings and started working in their couches and weird settings and everything kind of just went out of whack. We, we saw a huge spike in just this more posture-related back and neck pain. So there is different things that you can do ergonomic wise, especially a lot of people are still doing work from home just to make sure you keep everything as ergonomically friendly as possible for you to reduce just chronic wear and tear on your back and neck, depending on what positions you're sitting in. Medication management. So this is non-opiate. So we're not entering the world of tramadol, oxycodone, Percocet, things like that. And it's not so much that we're trying to stay away from that completely. Sometimes it's needed, but a lot of time, believe it or not, that type of medication doesn't help this type of pain. Um, a lot of the nerve pain doesn't respond very well to that type of medication. So we have a couple of options. One's your anti-inflammatory. So this is anything like Advil, Celebrex, Naproxen, Mobic, Diclofenac. These are should be really taken, can be taken consistently at first, but really after about two weeks, you want to start taking it as needed. These medications are not super, super safe and benign. So the more you take it consistently, you're going to increase your risk of high blood pressure, cardiac issues, stroke risk, stomach bleed, stomach pain. All of this can happen with these anti-inflammatories. Another one is if you're on some sort of blood thinner, your Eliquis, Xarelto, Plavix, you really should not be taking this because your risk of an internal bleed is going to skyrocket by taking it. Tylenol or acetaminophen. So this helps a lot with pain. This won't take away inflammation, but this can help with pain. Sometimes when it's really bad, you can take up to 3000 milligrams a day and, and really be safe with respect to affecting your liver. One question I get asked a lot is the difference between extra strain Tylenol and Tylenol arthritis. Hopefully no one works for Tylenol. This is just a marketing gimmick. Tylenol arthritis is just 150 milligrams more of extra strain Tylenol. 
and it makes the math of staying under 3,000 milligrams a day a little bit more difficult. So I usually tell everyone, just stick with the extra strength 500 milligrams, and you can double up on it. So that would be 1,000 and take it three up to three times a day as you need it. Steroid pack or a Medrol dose pack. This is really good for that acute kind of immediate 10 out of 10 pain. It's usually a six day pack will kind of knock out the pain, hopefully by day two or three. And, and most people respond quite well to this. It's a good way to get out of pain very quickly. Um, gabapentin and Lyrica, these are nerve pain medications. This helps, it's not an anti-inflammatory, it's a nerve destabilizer, but it's basically there for that nerve pain, numbness and tingling. People who have neuropathy, you might hear that they're on it. Um, a lot of people say, my dog's on it. They do give it for anxiety and things like that. But it's it's actually a pretty good medication for nerve type pain um, that you get with type of pinched nerve in your neck and your low back. And then your muscle relaxers. That's your cyclobenzaprine or flexoril or tizanidine. These guys here, I, I always try to explain, these are not really pain relievers. They're going to help if you have active spasms. If you have pain and you just take these, these may not necessarily help very much. Um, but they can help reduce kind of that muscle tightness. And, and some people I say, take it at night. The side effect of the gabapentin and muscle relaxers is drowsiness. So it helps you get some sleep. Physical therapy wise, there could be a whole separate lecture on types of physical therapy, but not all physical therapy is the same. So a big part of spine therapy is going to be core strengthening. Um, and this is not just doing crunches or anything like that. This is more working on kind of the smaller ignoring, ignored core muscles in the body to try to help strengthen and stabilize the back as much as possible. There's McKenzie therapy, which is an extension-based physical therapy. This is pretty good when someone has like a disc herniation. Um, this kind of helps the disc move its way back into the spine. Um, there's flexion physical therapy. And then for more of a kind of, this is more for pediatrics, but if you have significant scoliosis, um, especially in the pediatric population, you'll start what's called trough physical therapy. Um, so now we'll get to, to the interventional spine part or the injection part. This is, we've tried everything else. Nothing is really helping get rid of all that pain. We've looked at the MRI. We see what the issue is. Where can we essentially put the needle to help? So this comes back again to the axial and kind of radicular pain that we were talking about. So axial pain, these are the facets or the joints of the spine. Based on where your pain pattern is, kind of to our earlier slides, kind of gives us an idea of which facets are being affected. A lot of times the upper cervical, so your C2 to C4 region, you'll get headaches with it. You'll get what's called cervicogenic headaches. These are headaches that kind of will wrap around the back of the head and go to the eye. They almost seem like a migraine, um, but believe it or not, it's all just due to the arthritis and inflammation in your neck. That's what's causing it. So you can take as much headache medication as you want. If you don't treat the neck, the headaches are probably going to keep coming back. Lower cervical, that's your C5 to C7 level. That's when you see that shoulder pain or, or that pain in the schneck I was talking about. Um, so this was kind of, you want to target these joints there. Lumbar pain, so low back, same thing with the facets. So chronic kind of facet pain can be as high as 15% in kind of the younger population and up to 40% in most of the older patients. This is kind of one of the main things that we treat. Axial pain is a big issue. And one of the main reasons why we as physical medicine rehab and interventional spine docs see a lot of patients with facet pain is because Spine surgery is not really made for facet pain or axial pain. Spine surgery, and, and our surgeons will tell you, spine surgery works really well when there's leg like pain involved. You want to avoid spine pain if all you have is back pain. Those are usually the spine surgeries that may or may not help out very much. So they end up coming to us for a lot of these injections. So the types of injections for the facet, it's a, what's called a medial branch block, or most people know it as a radiofrequency ablation. This is burning the nerves in your back to help get rid of that back pain. Um, they, we also do steroid injections in these joints, but believe it or not, insurances are now starting to deny this altogether because this medial branch and ablation pathway is a more, I hate to say it, cost effective for the insurance company, but in, in all realistic, to be completely realistic, these steroid injections last maybe two, two weeks to maybe three months, while the ablation, if you qualify for an ablation with the blocks, you can get anywhere from six to 14 months of pain relief without having to take any medicine or any injection. So 
this is kind of what we're aiming towards doing for most of the axial back pain we have. Um, very briefly, these nerves here, these tiny ones that we see at the joints, these nerves are sensory. They tell your brain that this joint hurts. So what we do is we go in there and we essentially kill that nerve. Um, and that gets rid of the pain into the joint because your brain no longer is getting the signal that says this joint hurts. These nerves don't do anything with strength or anything like that. So you have no side effects from it. It's really just pain relief. Um, the reason why your pain comes back after six, six to 14 months, even though we killed it, is because your body grows that nerve back. And we don't know how to stop that yet in medicine. So um, it lasts pretty much as long as it takes for the body to grow the nerve back. But that usually does not happen any sooner than six months. Radicular pain or pain down the leg. So this is where the all famous epidural comes into play. So very different than pregnancy epidural. The point of these epidurals is for you to walk in and walk out that day. The pain does not go away immediately. It takes about two to three days to start taking effect and it can keep working over the next two weeks. So I tell all my patients, don't call it a failed attempt until kind of two weeks go by. Vast majority by two to three days after the injection, they are going to feel better um, and the pain is going to subside. Is the injection fixing anything? No, it is just there to get rid of your pain and get rid of the inflammation. And by doing that, we can then get you into physical therapy and help the body kind of heal itself. Most disc herniations will pull themselves back on their own without you having to do very much of anything. And as long as they get off that nerve, then your pain is going to also subside quite a bit. So that's what the injections are for. It's there to get rid of your pain keep the pain away and let your body continue to heal. Um, the other thing I'll just touch on briefly is not all epidurals are the same. There are different ways to do epidurals depending on what we see on the imaging. So this is why getting an MRI is so crucial prior to doing these injections is because they can tell me and, and the other physical medicine and rehab and interventional docs what epidural will be most effective to help you with your pain. I won't go into every single type super in detail, but there's an interlaminar approach, a transforaminal approach, and a caudal approach. And I have pictures here that kind of show us. So when you look at the spine here, this is kind of taking a cross section of the spine. The middle here, that's your spinal cord. These nerves are leaving the spine at every level. These are your nerve roots. These are the ones that are going down and you eventually will feel them down into your legs. So this is when people say your L4, your L5 nerve, it's these guys out here. Your epidurals can either come right in the middle of your spine, where they kind of coat all the nerves in the middle of the spine, or you can do what's called the transforaminal approach, which is I essentially come from the outside of the spine and put all the steroid around one nerve in particular. The reason why there are different types is because let's say you have a pretty good back and all you have is a disc herniation hitting one nerve, I will probably do what's called a transforaminal epidural. That way I put all the steroid right around that nerve. An interlaminar approach, I kind of explain it's like a shotgun process, if you will. So it's kind of spreading steroid along that whole entire area, um, which is still effective. It's not like one is more effective than the other. But if I know one nerve is the issue, I'm going to put all the steroid around that nerve to see if we can get it to calm down. The other difference is this transferaminal approach is diagnostic. And what I mean by that is sometimes a surgeon needs to see, hey, which nerve is the main issue? And it may not be clear just on exam and on imaging. So if I do, for example, a transferaminal epidural on L4 and all your pain goes away, it tells me, it tells you, and it tells your surgeon L4 is the problem. Um, an interlaminar approach is not diagnostic because all the medicine isn't going around one specific nerve. So even though this may also get rid of your pain, it won't give us any additional information regarding what nerve is the problem. Um, and these are just some injection pictures of kind of what we look for and how, how they look. So the picture under A, this is transferaminal. As you can see, it's kind of coming from the side. And B is what we call interlaminar, which is more coming in from the middle. And then the last one is something called the caudal epidural. This is one that I always try to explain very carefully that I am entering your spine from the tailbone because it's a little bit of an awkward place to put a needle. Um, believe it or not, it's not any more painful. Most of these injections, they are really, the worst part is numbing your skin. It's not really super painful. It's a little bit uncomfortable. Um, this is an approach we use if someone has had a lot of back surgery um, and there's a lot of either hardware or scar tissue back there. 
I'll come in from the tailbone. That way I can safely get the needle in and push the medication all the way up. Um, the only caveat with this is it really doesn't, the medication doesn't go any higher than L4, L5. So if the problem is higher than that, this type of epidural is not going to be very beneficial for you. Um, and then some other injections. We do the sacroiliac joint. That, that's a joint kind of in the back and in the pelvis. This is not spine per se, but it's where the sacrum and the iliac kind of join together. Um, this is something that we do to kind of put steroid at that joint that can get rid of that kind of pinpoint upper buttock pain that you have. Um, and this is kind of an x-ray shows kind of where that SI joint is. So you can see kind of where the spine was compared to where the SI joint is, um, which is a different type of injection that we could do. Last thing I'll talk about is these injections, they're not like hip injections or knee injections. There are things we need to take into account. One is blood thinners. Every blood thinner has a different number of days that need to be stopped depending on what type of injection we're doing. So we do make sure that these blood thinners are stopped. And what I do is I actually, we will get the clearance from your prescribing doctor, the blood thinner, and make sure it's okay with them. And, and my team takes care of all that for you before we do it. Diabetes. Epidural is a steroid. Steroid is going to shoot your sugars up. So we try to, at least at least me personally, my cutoff is A1C of 7.5. Um, anything higher than that, high, high risk that my epidural is going to send you to the ER because your blood sugars are going to be going very, very high into the four and 500. So we do, if you are diabetic, we do want to see what your A1C is within the last three months um, before we do an epidural. Kidney disease, Usually stage one, stage two kidney disease, I don't necessarily need clearance for it because I, I use less than one to two milliliters of contrast for these injections. And the whole point of contrast is so that I can see where my medicine is going before I inject. But some people have pretty decent stage three, stage four kidney disease. So we will get clearance to make sure that your, your, your nephrologist is okay with me using contrast in your back. Vaccination, this became big kind of with the COVID vaccine, but really any vaccination you get, you should wait two weeks before really any type of steroid. Steroid will bring your immune system down so people can just feel sick getting a steroid injection too close to any type of vaccine. Doesn't have to be just the COVID vaccine. Um, it's not an absolute no, but it's something that we do recommend. Um, and infections, if you have any active infection and you're on an antibiotic, or if you had a fever, you must be off of the antibiotics or you must have no fevers for a week. I am sticking a needle into the spinal canal and an infection in the spine around the nerves and around the spinal cord, um, you're not going to be very happy. It, it's gonna lead to a long hospital stay, six to eight weeks of IV antibiotics, and if there's an abscess surgery. So we do take infections very seriously. Make sure, A, all these injections are done sterilely, and we also make sure no one has had an infection before we do these um, epidurals and other types of spine injections for them. Um, that's basically it. I guess I'll open it up for questions. Happy to answer anything people might have, um, and hope you learned a little something from this lecture. That was really interesting. Thank you. We do have uh, just a couple questions here in the chat. Um, the first question is um, about acupuncture. Do you think acupuncture will help parts of the body? Yeah, so I mean, I'll, I'm not trained in acupuncture. I'll be the first to admit I don't know much about a lot of the science behind it, but I do prescribe it at least once a week, <laughs> I would say. People have pretty good response to it. I do explain the acupuncture is not going to fix any of the issues, but I tell people, neither is my epidural, right? So if you can get relief with acupuncture, I think it helps a lot of the muscular component of the pain. So a, a lot of that axial back pain and axial neck pain, I think people respond quite well to acupuncture. Um, I've actually just, from people giving me feedback, I have compiled kind of a list of, of acupuncturists that people have had good results with. So it is certainly something that I recommend. So if you can do it, go for it. I say the biggest Restriction with acupuncture is how much it costs, um, but I've actually started seeing insurances are starting to approve acupuncture, and they okay. are not advertising it, so I would ask your insurance company if they accept um, acupuncture. Sometimes you might just need a script from your physician to do so, um, and they cover some, if not all of it, for a certain number of sessions. That's so, great. For sure. Yep. Um. What if I have chronic lower back pain, but no pain down the leg? What can be done? Um, this person 
um, has pain strictly limited to the lower back, not pinching, just a chronic dull pain history of a herniated disc between L1 and 2. Yeah, so chronic low back pain, no radiation, that's your axial back pain, right? So if, if no one has kind of evaluated you for like what we call facet mediated pain, which is the ablation pathway and going after those joints in the back, that's probably what the issue is. Now, do you have to do injections? No, but it, it kind of depends how bad the pain is for you, right? So um, that is certainly something that I would evaluate for and, and kind of discuss that injection pathway. The physical therapy for it, I think would be beneficial. I would probably say, depending, I mean, it depends on the exam, right? But let's say you prefer to go into flexion. I'd say you probably need more of a flexion type physical therapy to kind of take pressure off of those joints in the spine. Um, but I think that's kind of what I would go after to help out with that type of pain, especially when it's chronic like that. Thank you. Okay. Um, having some neck pain, mostly in the back of my lower head, even into my ear, mostly when I'm lying down, would this be a spine issue? Oh, uh, hard to say without a full exam, right? Um, but back, low head, into the ear, it is common. That is a referred pain pattern, especially at C2, C3, and C3, C4. It can absolutely be a neck issue. Um, an x-ray alone may be able to kind of give us a lot of answers about that. Um, but that that would be, again, fall under that X axial neck pain type of problem. Um, so yeah, certainly it can be a neck issue. Uh, are there injections that be, can be given to upper spine that will help with nerve pain in the hand? So great question. So in the nerves that kind of will go into your hands is C6, C7, and C8. So if you have evidence about the, uh, either on an MRI that kind of shows those nerves are being pinched, an epidural in your neck can help with that type of pain. Something else that you might do is, is something that I do. Um, it's a test called an EMG or a nerve conduction study. It is to actually assess for any nerve damage anywhere from the wrist, elbow, shoulder, or neck. Um, one of the big things we see is carpal tunnel. Carpal tunnel will mimic C6 and C7 radiculopathy and vice versa. So uh, doing a kind of a nerve test may be something to consider um, to see if where that nerve pain is coming from. The nerve pain in the hands has to be coming from the neck or from the pinched nerves in the neck for an injection to do anything for it. Great. Um, can you please talk about muscle guarding and neck pain? Yeah, so muscle guarding, on it, what that kind of makes me think of is like whiplash. Um, a lot of times, or, or some sort of flare up of the arthritis in the neck, when you start getting the pain in the neck, your body is going to naturally respond by spasming up, essentially. It's your body's way of saying, hey, don't move, something is wrong. And something that I say is, if you have like a neck brace on, for example, once you feel better, you take the next break, you can take the neck brace off. The muscles, you can't rip them out of your body. So that guarding can eventually then also just lead to pain um, because the muscle is just so tight. And that's really where the physical therapy comes into play to help strengthen and stretch out those muscles um, to kind of get off of that guarding, that tightness from the guarding. Um, but if you are having that type of guarding, you also want to see why is it guarding? It's not just the fact that you're guarding and having muscle tightness. If it is a herniation back there that just keeps causing the neck to spasm up or severe arthritis in the joints of the neck that keep causing it to spasm up, you need to kind of get that looked at too. So um, that's kind of the correlation between those two. It's, it's why a lot of people with whiplash injuries or car accidents will get this vague neck pain that's kind of in the back of the neck and goes into the shoulders. Um, that really doesn't seem to subside very quickly. Right. Um, can you talk about chiropractic care? There's a couple of questions. So I guess just general chiropractic care. Sure. So, I mean, I'm not a chiropractor. Um, I am a DO, so I do have training in osteopathic manipulation. I don't do them myself in the practice, but I was trained in it and a big part of my medical school training. Um, but chiropractic can help. There's different techniques that they have that can help alleviate some of the pain in the back and even with radicular pain. I do kind of explain and, and chiropractics is a type of treatment. So a, a lot of times with chiropractics, you need someone to do those treatments to you. Um, and I think that's where one of the limitations, a lot of people say I do chiropractics and maybe they're hesitant to do physical therapy. Part of physical therapy is to also teach you the exercises so that you really don't need the therapist anymore so you can do it at home. So chiropractic care, absolutely 100%. I have no issue with it. 
to help out with the, those types of pain. But I also think a good home exercise program also needs to be put into place to help out with the pain that you're having because you really need to keep up with it on your own on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, probably the only time I say not to do chiropractics is in the neck. If you have severe spinal stenosis in the neck, um, a herniation or, or some type of compression on the spinal cord at that level can, can be detrimental um, with paralysis. Um, but a chiropractor will kind of ask you all that. It's not like they're going to ignore that altogether, but that's probably the only time me personally, I'll say avoid chiropractics is if there's severe stenosis in the neck. Um, now chiropractic also doesn't mean cracking and, and all the time either what we normally think of when we think chiropractic. So they certainly have other treatments, um, that they can do for you to help out with the pain. Hey, um, what conditions or criteria would point to a surgical treatment for a condition like maybe a herniated disc? When do you need surgery? Yeah. So when do you need surgery? It's your red flag symptoms. So that is weakness in your leg. Leg is kind of dragging or you're having a foot drop, which what basically means is you can't lift that foot up and it slaps back down again. Um, kind of the biggest one is what we call caudal equina syndrome, which is bowel or bladder incontinence. So that means you don't have any control of your bowel or bladder. You're having accidents on yourself and you don't really know about it. Um, any numbness or tingling, especially in the groin or in the private area, those are all things where I say don't even call, just go straight to the ER. Um, that tells us that the spinal cord is being compressed and you are going to need spine surgery. Um, most disc herniations, even if they're massive, may not need surgery unless there's like pretty significant weakness. So um, that's kind of the only time that I will skip everything and go straight to surgery is if there is significant weakness involved. Sometimes it's what we call pain limited weakness, which is it's not necessarily that your muscle is weak, it's that it just hurts a lot. Um, so you just can't move that specific muscle up and down. So um, that's a good thing to come into the office for and kind of be evaluated. Um, and then we can kind of guide you more on is this need surgery now or can we try other things first? Um, if pain returns after three months, do you recommend more injections? How many? How often? Yeah, great question. question. Great question. So the average shelf life of these injections is three to six months. So you can do them up to three times a year. Sometimes you can stretch it to four. Um, the reason why is you don't want to do that much steroid injections. The other reason why is insurance. Pretty much every insurance on the planet will not accept more than three of these a year. And the reason why they have that is because you do really want to limit how much epidurals you get. One thing I do is I kind of also track how many injections you have and if the window of uh, effectiveness is shrinking. So if I see the first one lasted eight months, next one lasted four months, then we do another one last one month. I'm, I'm just going to say it, it's it's the epidural has stopped being effective. I always say that's a risk of these epidurals, right? They will eventually stop being effective. Some people that's after two, some people that's after 50. <laughs> so uh, it really just depends. But yes, after three months, if it does come back, you can certainly get another one. Um, is a spinal cord stim implant effective? Yeah, so spinal cord stimulator, that is something that I usually will send the patients to pain management for. That uh, I, That's a whole separate lecture in itself, but it is effective. People have had very good results with it. Uh, I kind of put that as a last resort type of treatment for me personally, which means We've done medicine, PT, injections, nothing has helped. Either you've had surgery and it didn't help or you really don't want surgery. I will refer for a spinal cord stimulator evaluation um, and people have had very good results with them. Um, so I think it's certainly a great option, but I, I kind of, I do put that as a last resort type of uh, treatment for this when nothing else has helped. Um, our Dennis, our uh, stem cell injections beneficial? So, I don't know much about stem cells. I'll just say this. They have not been FDA approved yet. Um, people who get them have said they have helped. I have other people who get them that said they have done absolutely nothing. Insurance companies will not cover it. So it is a thousand, multiple thousand dollar treatment option. Um, it'd be something that I would, I would kind of defer that answer to someone who does them just to give you accurate information, just because I don't do it. Um, but it is something stem cells are something that's becoming a little more popular recently. Um, and I wouldn't be surprised if, if they start becoming more effective um, or being used more effectively down the line, but I, I don't have much information about that. Unfortunately, I'm sorry. Um, 
Um, here's a question about scoliosis. I've been told I have lumbosacral scoliosis and now having significant back pain. I was told surgery is not an option. Will this curvature become progressive? Is there a type of brace or traction I can use to stop or slow the progression of the curve? Um, so that all kind of depends on how bad the scoliosis is um, and, and where the scoliosis curve is. Um, bracing usually after you are no longer a child, bracing isn't going to help very much because once the spine has matured, um, it's, pre it's pretty much going to stay that way. Um, scoliosis gets worse as we get older because you start developing arthritis where the curvatures are. So that's why it depends where the curvature is. And it becomes kind of more of a degenerative scoliosis, which means that the spine kind of wears out. Um, really surgery for that type of thing is safe for if you have some sort of neurological issue because of it. Um, some people, if the scoliosis is really bad in the thoracic area, it can push on the heart and lungs and cause heart and breathing issues. That's when kind of the surgery comes into play. Um, other than that, it would be kind of hard to answer that question without seeing an x-ray and seeing where the, where the scoliosis is, how bad the scoliosis is. We can certainly do epidurals and then ablations, but again, those blocks will depend on how bad the scoliosis is and can I even safely get the needle where we need it to go. So, um, so what's the next step after injection? Say, you know, we've done epidurals and they're not working anymore. So what do we do next? Uh, surgery. Um, if epidurals are not working and that pain is not going away, that is when I send you to see a spine surgeon. Um, unfortunately, outside of that, there really isn't much more you can do. I mean, that's where kind of the non-traditional treatments like acupuncture come into play. Someone brought up like that regenerative medicine and, 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 and those types of treatment options or sometimes people go down that route because they really don't want spine surgery. Um, but really, if the epidurals are just not giving you that relief or the injections and everything conservative is not giving you that relief, that's when this conversation with the spine surgeon kind of becomes important. Um, can leg cramps in your quadriceps or calf result from disc radicular problems? Absolutely. Um, um, a lot of times people who have a pinched nerve in their back just show up with their calf cramping or their hamstrings cramping. Um, and, and it's all because of it's an L5 or an S1 issue. So um, if that's something that keeps happening, um, it's certainly very reasonable to get your back looked at because that could be the issue. Uh, what kind of treatment do you recommend if someone has disc compression in both their lumbar and cervical spine? So great question. Um, it all comes down to which one hurts you worse. <laughs> um, the reason why I say that is because insurance will not let you treat both at the same time. Um, I cannot do an injection in your neck and in your back in one session. They have to be two weeks apart, even from a safety point of view. Um, I certainly see people for both. The issue is, is and I kind of see it from the lecture too, it, they're not, they're complicated, right? So if you need to be tra treated for the neck and the low back, and, and I really want you to do physical therapy, you're looking at four days of physical therapy a week out of five. Um, which is a lot, that's a lot of copays involved. And, and you might start, one thing might help the neck, might flare up the low back. So it's one of those things where we really should take it one thing at a time. Um, and I always say whatever is worse or whatever is having more of like a major issue, I'd say I have to go after that first. And, and that's kind of where talking with the doctor kind of comes into play because they'll be able to assess based on the exam, tell you, hey, which route do we need to go with it? Doesn't mean you ignore one completely. A lot of times the oral medications you take are gonna help both, right? So if you take something by mouth, it's gonna go in your body, it's gonna treat everything. So it might be something, at least initially medication-wise, we can treat both with the same medication. But when it comes to therapy and injections and, and if it gets to surgery, it has to be one at a time. And insurances will deny two body parts. Um, uh, most insurances, I just say, will deny going after two body parts at the same time. What about injections after surgery? We do it all the time. Um, it, that kind of just depends on what type of surgery you have and can I get the needle where we need it to get. Um, and it also what the problem is after surgery, but certainly after spine surgery, we do injections all the time. Now I will say the ablations, you can't do it at the level where you had surgery because there's hardware, there's metal in there. So you can't get the needles where you need to go, but certainly you can do epidurals depending on the type of surgery you have changes what epidurals I can do, but you can do epidurals if you have radiating pain. Um, so it's certainly an option. Um, the surgery does not mean no injections. It just might limit what type of injections we can do.
Um, informed. How frequently do you recommend nerve blocks for someone who's been diagnosed with chronic regional pain syndrome? Um, this person's had two nerve blocks, one at suprasacral nerve, another at C7 level in the past. Um, so that's a question I'm going to defer to pain management. I don't treat CRPS. Um, that falls more under the pain management umbrella. Um, so I, I would not be the right person to kind of ask about how much of those you can get at time. I can tell you those injections you've had for it are what you do for that type of issue. Um, but the frequency and stuff, that would be something you'd have to ask a, a pain management physician. Um, I've been having neck pain near my shoulder and my shoulder clicks and it's sometimes stiff. It's only on my right side. Um, could be, could be a little bit of both. Um, so a, a nerve pain or a pinched nerve in your neck won't cause any clicking. Um, so the clicking is probably something within the shoulder itself, but it could be a little bit of both, right? I mean, unfortunately you're not, the body doesn't pick one thing. Um, and, and sometimes if you have a lot of shoulder pain, you favor that side and, your neck will hurt because of that, more muscular, or vice versa. You have an issue in your neck and you're kind of favoring that whole side and then the shoulder starts to hurt. So this is a classic kind of, you need to kind of be evaluated and for us to kind of be able to pinpoint what the issue is so that we can kind of guide you in the right direction, being either shoulder or, or neck. Um, but with clicking, clicking doesn't happen from a pinched nerve in the neck. So that tells me it's probably a shoulder issue. Um, would you do an ablation before epidural injections? And is everyone a candidate for injections? I got the rest of the question. Okay. Um, so this kind of goes back into what the purpose of the pain is, right? So if you have leg pain, an ablation is not going to help, and I won't. Do, I would not recommend it. If you just have back pain, an epidural is not going to help. So I would not do that. Now. You can have both, right? You can have leg pain and back pain. If leg pain is involved, I will do an epidural first because I can get rid of your leg pain and your back pain with an epidural. Sometimes we do an epidural and the leg pain is gone and the back pain is still there. That tells you you had two issues going on, right? It was not only the joints of your spine that were the issue, but also pinched nerves. So yes, you can do both. Given the ablation doesn't have any steroid, you, there's really no restriction of a time frame that you have to do like an ablation and an epidural with it. Um, but that all comes down to what is the pain that you're having. So Again, if it's just back pain, I would not do an epidural. If it's just leg pain, I would not do an ablation because um, they're not going to help those issues. Uh, for a patient with scoliosis, are there any injections for hypertonic muscular relief like Botox for hypertonic muscles in patients with neurological diagnoses such as cerebral palsy? 100%. So Botox is a big help for this. Um, this is something that I got in my physical and medicine and rehab training was we did do Botox. I don't do them, but there are certainly um, neuromuscular disorder specialists who are physiatrists who will do Botox injections. That reason is exactly why you'd kind of want to go down that route. So yes, absolutely. You can do Botox for that type of stuff. And last question. Um, I have post op fusion, leg numbness, and hip pain, would injections help? Kind of depends on what the images look like, to be honest. So if it's hip pain, meaning if it's groin pain, yes, a hip injection would help. Sometimes it would also be important to know what the pain was like before the fusion, right? Sometimes the surgery is not going to get rid of all of the pain. That is something that can happen. So if this is new since after surgery, the MRI would kind of give us some information about, hey, what nerves are still being irritated back there and have some compression. And then you can do epidurals and, and, and injections to help out with that. But absolutely, I mean, like I said, post-op, we see a lot of post-op patients with radicular pain. Um, and we do epidurals all the time, but that really, we need to kind of, that's where the imaging is most important so that we can target your pain appropriately with the injections. All right, just make sure, yep, that was the last question. So um, just wanted to let everybody know in the chat, I have my cell phone number and my email. If you have any further questions, if you want to schedule an appointment, anything like that, you can reach out to me directly. And I just wanted to thank everybody for taking the time. I know we're all so busy. So thank you for taking the time, especially Dr. Abudia. Thank you so much. It, this was really, really informative. I learned a lot. <laughs> yeah, no, ha happy to help. Part of the battle is knowing what pain I'm having and, and what doctor do I need to go to, especially in orthopedics. So I hope this helped kind of clear some things up and, and hopefully 
um, we can guide you in the right direction. Great. And um, just for everybody's information, this session was recorded. It'll be uploaded to our YouTube page in the next few days, and you'll get an email from me, I think, by next Tuesday. It usually goes, goes out with uh, the link to that presentation so you can review anything you'd like to see again. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you all.